the hottest news in macroeconomics this week. We're recording on the 11th of November, Veterans Day in the United States, and Remembrance Day across much of the rest of the Western world, I think, Jeff, is uh, inflation. Inflation. It started because the United States reported their consumer price index numbers, which were very high. But it's not just a story about the United States. We're going to talk about inflation and the bond market's reaction. We're going to focus on the United States, but Jeff Snyder, head of global research for Alhammer Partners, would you be surprised that in the last 36 hours, there's been a litany of reports about high inflation readings around the world? Let me give you just some examples. Mozambique inflation rate near four-year high. Don't worry, there are more important countries too coming up. Japan producer prices rise to the most in near four decades. Belarus inflation rate near five-year high. El Salvador rate near at 10-year high. Brazil inflation rate at new five-year high. Greek October inflation rate highest since 2011. Moldova, Jeff. Where else would you hear about this? Moldova, October inflation rate, highest since 2016. Lithuania, 12-year high. Danish inflation rate, highest since 2011. Romania, highest in over a decade. Germany, confirmed at 4.5%, the highest since 1993. It goes on. Norway, producer price inflation hits record. Again, month after month, China producer Inflation highest since 95. Ecuador inflation rate over five-year high. Mexico inflation rate at near four-year high. And then we had the results from the United States. Which was a near 30-year high. We've got CPIs, at least. We have consumer price indices indicating consumer prices that are, that are uh, not only rising, but in October seem to have accelerated. So that's really kind of the story here is that we have high rates of consumer price increases, but is it inflation? And that's the, that's the discussion that you and I have been having with the audience for how many months now, ever since this really began, there's a difference between a consumer price, a consumer price index rising for other reasons and consumer prices going up because of actual inflation, which you're going to force me to use the term, I think eventually monetary inflation which is really all that inflation is. It's, it's an ex excessive money supply in the real economy, too much money chasing too few goods. That's inflation when uh, the, the real question here is how do we tell what's, what's creating consumer price increases at any period in time and any period in history? What do we use? How do we sort out one CPI from another? Well, we go to the bond market. You say we, but I think it's best that you and I not do it because we may be wrong in any particular time. It's best to rely on the wisdom of the crowds that have a lot of money riding and identifying pervasive, persistent monetary inflation versus transitory supply demand imbalances that, while terrible, it may last longer than you would think when you say transitory, are not going to be there long term. I guess that's the question we have to define. What is long term? We're going to talk about the components of the CPI numbers first, then we're going to turn to the bond market second. So we'll talk about the components, Jeff. Uh, oh, by the way, if anyone wants to read along, they can, following your work at the Alhambra Investments blog, they can go and find the article, How Can a CPI Now Above 6 Price Like This? And it was posted yesterday, November 10th, 2021. Jeff, the results were like all just very, very high, whether you look at core or just the headline. If you look at the headline month over month change from 1950 to 2021, this was in the 95th percentile, the October reading. The year over year change for the headline, between 85th and 90th percentile. Even if you exclude energy and food and you get look at core, the core month over month change, looking at all months, 1957 through 2021, October's reading was in the 90th percentile, and the core year-over-year -year change, 75th percentile. Yeah, I mean, there's no question that consumer prices are rising, and the million-dollar question, or actually the multi-trillion-dollar question is why? And that's really, you know, when we start to break in and dig into the CPI numbers, what you see is that, you know, what's amplifying these price increases is essentially two basic, two major parts of the bucket. 
and that's energy and cars. You've got new vehicle prices that are going up, but used vehicle prices, which are just through the roof, and believe it or not, even though it's not a relatively high part of the CPI bucket, used cars, because not everybody buys used cars every year, it has created a substantial amount of this, it's responsible for, or has contributed a substantial amount of these annual gains all year. So if, you have, if you're not buying a used car, your experience with consumer prices is different. And of course, we know what's going on in the automobile segment. It's not monetary inflation. It's not too much money chasing too few cars. It's literally too few cars for whatever level of demand. You, you only need to look at some of these social media posts about empty dealer lots, and you can see what's driving prices, of course, in new cars as well as used cars. Because if there aren't any new cars available, used cars are going to be in high demand. Then the other part of it, of course, is what everybody has focused on, and rightfully so, which is crude oil. And crude oil flowing into everybody's uh, personal experience in the form of gasoline. Every time you go fill up your car, you notice how much more expensive it is to do so, especially over the last five or six months. And again, but that's not, you know, as usually it might be, or historically it has been, this is not oil prices rising because the Federal Reserve is printing money or the euro dollar system is legitimately printing money as it had in the run-up to the pre in the pre-crisis era. This is, again, a supply story and a very clear supply story. You know, OPEC countries have said, we're not going to raise production to match demand because we kind of like these high prices. And even domestically in the United States, you, uh, U.S. oil and gas production is down about 13 percent from where it was before the COVID recession. So American domestic producers are holding down production, too, even as prices rise. Let's talk about that some more. But that's very interesting. Now. I have heard that natural gas prices are crazy high. We discussed it several episodes ago and that there are geographic factors. There was an earthquake in one field, natural gas field, and geopolitical factors that perhaps Russia isn't too keen on saving Europe's rear sector and giving them uh, natural gas. Okay, so geopolitical factors. But then you mentioned OPEC. And the United States producers are not increasing production, which is unusual. I would think if you see high prices, you would want to increase production. So are you suggesting that perhaps they are not convinced that these prices are going to be sustainable, that the demand for continued acceleration in prices is not going to be there? Yeah, and you have to remember that a lot of domestic production is the expensive oil, the shale oil that is, you know, that is not profitable unless oil prices stick around at, you know, some level, you know, the people have thrown around $70 or so as a break even point for a lot of those those production plays. And maybe that's the case, maybe it's not. We don't really know for sure, but it does seem to be what's going on here where oil producers need to be convinced that oil prices are going to stick around in the 80s, 70s, 80s, maybe even 90s or more before they start ramping back up production because over the last 18 months, they have obviously very clearly said, even as oil prices are rising steadily, we're not going to raise production levels. And so you have to ask yourself, why is that the, Why is that happening? Why are producers not willing to ramp up production to the level, even just to the levels that they were before, uh, before the recession last year? Geopolitics, or they're worried about demand and demand. Persists, that's being the other sustainable. part, right? Because that's, that's, you know, everything we've been talking about so far is, is supply. Right, it's supply, 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 limited supply, limited supply, and that's true. But why are supplies so much limited? Some of it is, you know, regular logistical snafus that we've been hearing about port traffic, you know, rail yards all screwed up, and things like that. But you have to also consider that, you know, as we're moving forward, maybe suppliers and producers are thinking, this the party's, you know, it's not going to last forever. There's a downside. There's a there's a there's a uh, slowdown here. We don't know how big that slowdown is going to be, and it's specifically in terms of oil. Any slowdown in demand, oil tends to be a little bit touchy about those those periods when demand is becomes uncertain or question un, or a little more uh, questionable than it had been. You know, I'm thinking 2014, 2015, for example, or 2018 and 2019, where oil prices seemed to fall very quickly, and for at least most of the mainstream, it seemed it, it came about in unexpected, surprising fashion. So maybe oil producers, having been bitten once too many times in the past, are a little bit more reluctant this time to embrace the rise in oil prices because there are legitimate concerns about how dependable demand will be in the future.
That's the point I wanted to bring up, is that their fingers have been singed already. They've been bitten several times. You mentioned a couple of examples. 2008 is another example you didn't mention. That was a precipitous fall in oil prices. I don't remember about 2011 and 12, Jeff. I remember other commodity prices fell dramatically in that time period. Uh, do you remember what happened to oil in that in that time span? It took a little bit of a step back in 2011, but it was over $100 a barrel all the way into 2014. And 2014 was then oil catching up with the rest of the commodity space, which I think, you know, you're right, Emil. I think that's really the lesson that oil producers have kind of held in the back of their mind where they thought, you know, 2013 seems to be OK. The rest of the commodity space is a mess, but we're doing OK. And then you get into 2014 when the global economy is supposed to be accelerating and all of a sudden the global economy falls off a cliff. Nobody warned oil producers and it just was a complete mess for a couple of years, which made, you know, I think what your point here, which was a very powerful lesson in the oil community, in the oil space, which was let's be a little bit cautious about, you know, overproducing, especially the less profitable production areas. Let's turn to the bond market reaction. Yesterday, the yields went up precipitously, meaning, well, precipitously, you tell me if you agree with that description, they went up quite sharply relative to where they were on earlier this week. But if we take a little bit bigger perspective, they had been in a downtrend for a while. We'll talk about that later in uh, part two of our episode. We'll talk about something you call the landmine and bond yields in the direction that they're heading down. But bond yields went up. We're going to talk about how the bond market reacted in four or so different measures here. We'll look at the nominal yield, the yield curve, treasury inflation protected security break even, so the anticipated inflation rate, the tips yield curve, and yield real rates. So let's start with nominal rates. What did they do yesterday on the news? You're right. Yeah. It was a sell-off and it was a sharp sell-off, but I don't think it was anything unusual. Of course, it's going to be overhyped in the media because any time the bond market ever sells off, it's you know front page news. And then they don't report on all the other times where bond yields are actually falling, which is why, mm. as, you're, as you were mentioning and alluding to here, bond yields, even after the sell-off, are basically where they were about a week ago. And they're still significantly less than they were eight months ago. So, you know, they're lower than the peak, which was set back in the middle of March, uh, middle of March this year. And you have to wonder what's going on here, because it's not just that we had one six percent CPI in October. There were four five plus CPI, five percent CPIs in the months before then. And then the, the one before that was actually four point nine nine percent. So for the last six months in a row, we've had very elevated CPIs. Yet during those six months including yesterday's sell-off, bond yields have been falling in, by and large, not in a straight line or not directly, but their bond yields are going moving lower or at least sideways, at least in the long end, where some of the short-term rates are moving a little bit higher, which is a response to something other than CPIs as well. I'm so glad you mentioned that. If I would tell the audience there's one key takeaway, I would say it was that, what you just mentioned, that we've had several consecutive eye-watering, paint-blistering CPI readings, and the bond market has been heading downwards generally during this time. And during the worst of it, it's been just flat if we take a longer-term perspective. Okay, so yesterday, though, the news came out, bonds sold off sharply. What about relative measure, the yield curve? Yeah, and I think that's the most important one because the sell-off was mostly focused on the short end, which, of course, as everybody knows, is, is uh, more influenced by the Federal Reserve's potential policies in the future. So the bond market was basically saying, hey, they're tapering anyway. So the chances they actually get to a rate hike, which is, you know, it affects short term parts of the yield curve because the Federal Reserve offers alternative monetary rates, which you have to factor into your return risk return consideration. So if you think the Fed is going to get to some rate hikes, then short term rates down the, you know, in that, that the area where the rate hikes are going to happen are going to start to adjust to those potential rate hikes. So that's what's going on in the short end. The market's saying, look, the Federal Reserve, the CPIs, they're going to convince the Fed to taper and then eventually rate hike. There's a good chance that it actually happens. And that's what's going on in the short end. Now, the long end is saying, yeah, that's, that's what the Fed's going to do, but it's wrong to do it because these CPIs are not going to stick around. 
and the growth and growth and opportunity that's embedded in longer term in, in, in expectations and longer term bond yields are saying, you know, the the economy is slowing down, not picking up. So the Fed is going to do its taper. It's going to affect the short run, maybe some rate hikes eventually if they get that far. But it's not going to go very far at all because the economic climate, the longer run or intermediate longer run economic climate is getting is growing worse by the month. So what we have as a result of the short end adjusting to the Fed and the long end picturing growth and opportunity becoming more and more difficult is you have a flattening yield curve. So even yesterday during the sharp sell off, most of it was in the short end. You had the five year treasury, for example, sell off, I think it was 12 or 13 basis points, or maybe it actually was more, maybe it was 14 or 15. And the 10 year treasury only sold off about a 10 or 11. So even the, the five year, 10 year spread yesterday flattened by a, a couple of basis points, bringing the yield curve spread down to about 33, 34, which is the flattest, this important part of the yield curve has been since early August of 2020, back when we were really close to recession. So the, the yield curve message altogether is, yeah, after yesterday's CPI, the Fed is probably going to be more convinced to continue these taper than rate hike policies. And the long end saying they were they're absolutely wrong to do so. If the audience is wondering why are we so focused on the bond market, I urge them to go back to episode 150, where we reviewed how the bond market interpreted both monetary inflation as well as transitory supply, demand, and balances throughout the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 2000s, and 2010s. And it's this market that is consistently prescient in identifying and determining which flavor of price increases we're witnessing. All right, let's talk about Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. The break-evens, the headline that we all look at, those rows, signifying inflation is anticipated. But again, let's talk about the relative measure of the TIPS curve. Jeff, what did we see there? Yeah, well, we start out, TIPS gets paid or gets reimbursed by the government by the CPI. So the CPI is very important in, in TIPS. Therefore, the, you know, TIPS don't really care about if it's inflation or a supply shock because the government's going to pay you for either one. So TIPS is sort of a measure of the CPI rated inflation. And of course, going back to August, uh, October 21st, you know, when we had the last five-year TIPS auction, the shorter run inflation expectation, which are break-even rates, and a break-even rate is simply the real yield minus the nominal yield of the same maturity. It's a distance between what you're actually getting in TIPS versus the nominal U.S. Treasury, which tells you a measure of a relative measure, not a one-for-one -one measure of what the market is expecting for average CPI inflation that it's going to be reimbursed by the government when the, when the instrument uh, uh, matures. And the break-even rates, they, got, they went up after that auction, the five-year auction in late October. The, break, the short run break even rate skyrocketed up into a record high. And after yesterday's CPI, the five year went up even higher, as you would expect, because you know, we have higher CPI averages that the government is going to end up paying to tips, tips, uh, tips holders when those instruments come due. Now, the 10 year break even rate went up too, but it's gone up a lot less than the five year. And it's almost like the five year is kind of yanking the 10 year upward with it because there seems to be some sort of at least skepticism or reluctance to embrace CPI protection at the longer, or the farther end of the tips curve, whether it's the 10 year or even the 30 year. Last final thought from me, Jeff, a couple of minutes. Uh, well, I wanna raise the idea of real yields. Where are they? And do you have any concluding thoughts regarding this episode? Yeah. So. What we see is that actual inflation expectations diminish over time. We see that not only in the, in the tips curve inversion, but also the five-year, five-year forward rate, which is, has never really moved out of the post-2014 rut. So altogether, what the bond market is saying is that, yes, the CPI went up, it went up even higher, but it's still not inflation. It's not going to last. It's not going to stick around because as we see in real yields, which are the other side of tips, the other side of break-evens, the economic climate is just awful. And, and the economic potential that's in the intermediate and longer term that's being pictured by real yields, I mean, real yields at record lows tells you that the market is saying, this is not an economic climate conducive or to, that's, that's conducive to inflation because there can't be the money flowing through it that would create actual recovery and economic activity that's going to last beyond any short run supply factor. In part two of this episode, we're going to discuss something that Jeff calls the landmine, 
which I believe means how bond markets react as they're approaching some sort of break in the economic outlook and where we were before the CPI news hit. So stick around.